hearing agenda item number five. That is the development code amendments related to accessory living areas. Staff report. It's going to be old school today. I'm not doing a PowerPoint presentation. What's that? It says it's going to be old school today. We're not going to do a PowerPoint presentation. There's really uh, um, n not a lot of appropriate graphics to go along with some of these text amendments. So I just I want to spend a few minutes just trying to explain what we're doing and, try and try also try to put it in context a little bit because, uh, you know, there have been for years and years um, multiple discussions about um, uh, units, um, second units, main units, um, affordable housing units, uh, and um, this is a sort of continuation in, in some respects of, of those discussions. The um, county um, currently uh, allows single-family dwellings, and as you know, the county also allows second units um, uh, to be in, um, part of a single-family dwelling use. That does not increase the density. Um, it falls out from state law um, covering second units. There are certain restrictions about second units. Uh, you have to go through a second unit permit process. Uh, there are um, requirements for uh, parking for second units. And um, it's a ministerial process, but it does mean that people need to meet certain standards. Uh, so that's the way the county currently deals with second units. Uh, now, although they are not second units, people are allowed to have um, wet bars w in their homes. And those wet bars are sort of uh, limited by um, te some technical specifications. You can't really have a full kitchen, but you can have some counter space. You can have a hot plate. You can have a mini fridge. Uh, so we see those in pool houses, um, which people have no intention of using for, for guests. Uh, we also see them sometimes in, you know, downstairs of a home uh, where people might have uh, um, guests coming to stay with them for a short period of time. Uh, and sometimes we have we see those for, um, you know, people who perhaps want a um, aging relative to be able to stay with them and have some degree of independence um, within that area, but uh, not, but it wouldn't actually increase um, the density, and it wouldn't actually be a, a unit because the wet bar is not a full kitchen. It's not defined as a food preparation facility. So with that backdrop, um, the uh, uh, proposal today is trying to take a look at where these um, uh, regulations are um, throughout the code regard with respect to wet bars and clarify and refine and add a couple of um, specific restrictions to those. So the way it currently works is that there's one section of the code which says you can have a wet bar. Uh, another section of the code says you can have a snack bar. Snack bars and wet bars are virtually identical, um, so that's a little bit confusing there. Um, and uh, the code also allows you to rent out a certain number of bedrooms, three, up to three, in your single family residence. Um, so what this is trying to do is bring those somewhat disparate elements of the code uh, and clarify them by putting in the land use tables this uh, accessory living area as a separate land use, just the way that bedrooms and, and other things are, are listed as separate um, land use, and establish certain standards in the um, section re with respect to accessory uses to single family dwellings and to clarify the definitions, uh, and to also specify um, that, the area, that these areas cannot be used for short-term rentals. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that for in, in just a minute. Um, the, it's important to understand there's another context uh, that this kind of fits within. So in this area, in this, it's just a accessory living area. It's not a dwelling unit. That's very distinct from uh, a second unit, which is a dwelling unit, but still doesn't increase the density. 
What there's been a lot of discussion about more recently or, or is what is called in various proposals at the state level uh, junior accessory dwelling units. That discussion is not complete at the state level, but what it is doing is responding to what many people have found to be impediments to actually having um, these accessory, these small accessory units within their homes, um, whether it's a, a second unit or um, a junior second unit. And the reason is because even though the county has been at some pains uh, to streamline the second unit process while keeping the standards clear and adequate. Uh, what people find, even when they're going through um, an amnesty permit process with the county, is that when they come into the county, they do everything that we ask them to do, and uh, then they get their second unit permit. Um, we keep the process relatively inexpensive. We try and, and um, be responsive. Um, but then their next step, once they have that second unit permit, is that they have to um, deal with some of the other agencies, in particular the special districts. So for example, they may go to the fire department. The fire department in some places may say, well, even though the rest of your house is not sprinklered, this area of the second unit must now be sprinklered. Or they go to the um, water district and they say, well, since you now are having a second unit, we want you to pay an additional hookup fee. Sometimes that hookup fee is $15,000. Right or the sanitary fee, right? So what's happening in, in what's happened in the past at the county level, but I think more broadly throughout the state, is that people go through these relatively <laughs> expedited process at the planning level, but then the fees that they run into, and, some, and sometimes the um, the other requirements from other agencies that they run into at the building permit stage, um, are uh, impediments to them actually building those second units. So the way I at least understand the, um, the idea at the state level to have junior accessory dwelling units is for the state to essentially step in and say, if you're following certain standards, you're, you're having the second um, dwelling unit relatively small, like 500 feet, uh, you're putting it into the existing residence, you are um, meeting some other, some other standards, then we, the state, will tell those special districts that they cannot impose those additional costs on you. So it's a, it's a, since the county doesn't have the ability to go to a water district or the fire department and say, no, you're not allowed to really impose those, but the state does. And my understanding is that the state is attempting to come up with a plan that will help people to reduce those impediments by essentially stepping in and telling special districts that they can't impose those additional costs as long as it's a very small a junior dwelling unit within an existing house. That process is not complete. Um, I, I'm somewhat optimistic that it, it, it will be um, complete at the state, state level. And I think uh, you know, that when that process is complete, we may want to be able to step back and take a look at what our code says and say, OK, so now you have perhaps a uh, second unit which, um, which you know, probably in the future will be allowed to be 1,000 square feet in size, right? And in that case, you, then you have additional parking requirements. Uh, you have, may have additional sprinkling requirements. Uh, the MWD may be able to impose additional hookup fees, sanitary district fees, that type of thing. So that would be, you know, a, an additional second unit. Um, the, other, the other choice would be you can have an accessory living area where it's not actually a dwelling unit, right? It's just this a living area, uh, which is somewhat separate. You have a little bit of independence, but it's really not a full kitchen. Um, and then there will be this other sort of tier, which is what the state is working on now, where you have a junior accessory dwelling unit. And I think we'll probably want to take a look at that if that actually when we see what comes out at the state level to see whether or not we can use what they've done and implement that in our code. So right now we're beginning that work by looking at this sort of lowest tier of the accessory um, living area. So it's not a unit, it's just a living area. We allow these right now. Right? So we're, it, what we're doing is refining them and adding some more restrictions. 
So right now there is no limit on the number of, of wet bars or snack bars you can have in your home. What we're doing is we're taking that and trying to line that up with the limit that we do place on, on um, bedrooms, which is three for an accessory for a, a, a rental bedroom. We're also taking a look at, the, for the first time, at short-term rentals. Um, I somewhat reluctantly put this in because short-term rentals are really a much larger discussion. If you follow the news, you'll, you'll find that uh, there are a variety of different, especially larger jurisdictions throughout the state, Los Angeles, San Francisco, who have tried to get a handle on short-term rentals because of concerns um, by uh, various communities that you're essentially turning a, a home into a hotel uh, and also concerns uh, uh, that you're essentially, by turning it into a hotel, you're reducing the amount of, of housing that would otherwise be available for people to rent on a long-term basis. There are opposing views of this as well, and I think you got a, a letter today um, uh, kind of raising this issue. Um, which is a very valid issue that in some cases, I think especially when someone is renting out a room within their home or we're really only doing it temporarily, that it, it helps them to pay their mortgage where they might not otherwise be able to pay, that, pay a mortgage. I don't think that there's a silver bullet for this issue. I do think that it requires us to kind of step back and look at the um, larger context, what other jurisdictions have done, uh, how those changes would, take, would uh, affect the county, uh, if we try to impose those changes, and of course, um, the enforcement issues, which are fairly complicated in terms of, um, of short-term rentals. So what we're planning on doing is we, we've um, asked uh, for some help from outside consultants who are familiar with how other jurisdictions have dealt with this. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We do want to understand what other jurisdictions have done. And we're going to be bringing in the fall a kind of workshop white paper to the Board of Supervisors and asking for their looking at some of the positives and minuses of different approaches and asking <clears throat> for their direction about which avenue to pursue in terms of code amendments because it is a much more complicated issue than what we're dealing with today. So I think once we get that direction from the um, Board of Supervisors, then we'll do a more broad-based effort at looking at well um, whether we want to um, try to regulate short-term rentals, and if so, how we want to try and regulate them, what the impacts of those regulations would be. Um, so today is just um, uh, the first sort of foray into that, but I, I, I um, do want to um, say that we're going to be taking a much closer um, look at those and bring um, some ideas to the board of supervisors. Uh, so with all that in the context, and I, I think I looked up a um, uh, I found a website where it sort of talked about um, all the different definitions and use of terms for different units and that kind of thing. It had some 30 or 40 different terms for what are essentially the same thing. So it's very easy to get lost in definitions when you start dealing with these things. Uh, but it's also important to understand what the, those definitions mean because a junior accessory dwelling unit, if you look at some of the state law, it, that's really um, uh, within the second unit arena. It is a, a separate actual unit. That's not exactly what we're dealing with here today because at least my reading of it is is the benefit that, that, that those state laws are intended to promote is really making sure that there aren't these additional fees and requirements and fire departments and water districts and that kind of thing um, for these very small units. We're not really going there today because I think we need to wait and see what comes out at the state level, but you may down the road see us um, trying to deal with it, um, that in a more um, forward fashion. Uh, the last thing I'll say about the context is that, you know, this was something that the, that, um, you know, the idea of trying to clarify and refine our current um, standards about accessory living areas came up uh, in the uh, discussion at the board level about uh, how, to, how to remove impediments for housing. And um, they wanted to see some results right away. So we're bringing this uh, forward now. But please remember that we're very shortly following on with a much more comprehensive set of code amendments. And we'll be releasing those um, hopefully uh, later in August for public review before bringing it to your commission. 
and that's where we'll, you'll see some changes to the second unit requirements and that kind of thing. Uh, it, it remains to be seen what will have happened at the state level at that point. We'll have, just have to um, deal with it um, at that time if it, if it um, seems like it's been resolved at the state level. So um, I'm available for questions if you have any, and otherwise you can open it up for public comment. Questions to Jeremy? Commissioner Holland. Um, two issues I wondered if you had considered when you drafted this language and why what your thinking was in not including this material. One is an owner occupancy requirement. Did you consider that as something that would be in? Well, uh, again, remember that th these are already allowed. Right, so there's currently no owner <coughs> occupancy requirement for an accessory living area or a room rental, okay. um, but there is an owner occupancy requirement for a second unit. Most, most. Of them. So I'm not proposing to further the okay. the idea is to clarify these so that they're more common, okay. not to further restrict them. Okay. The second one is, um, since you're allowing these um, owner occupancy, uh, I'm sorry, ALAs, accessory living areas. In accessory structures, um, there's no bathroom requirement. Right, and um, again, there's currently there is no bathroom requirement, so we haven't changed that existing approach. We're not putting in a bathroom requirement, and there's um, uh, in many cases where someone might have a, a pool house, um, and if some if a guest comes to stay for a little while. Uh, they would be using the bathroom in the main, ha main house. But this isn't about guest staying. This is about rentals. Yes, right. So, I mean, they would be, they're really part of the main house living area. Okay. You know, a person, you know, wouldn't be able to rent out um, a, uh, a separate living area without having a bathroom, without understanding that the person ha would have to oh. be able to have uh, <laughs> access to the bathroom. I can... Tell you a situation where that has happened. I can tell you situations where it probably happened too, but it's not conforming with the building code. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Cecilia? So uh, I've been struggling to try to understand understand this because it seems to me like everything that that this new accessory living area definition would allow already existed. In yes, the, that's okay, right. Okay. So if, if the purpose of this is to kind of move forward this concept of, of renting a room in a house as being some sort of affordable housing solution to some extent, I mean, I realize there's no income limits and none of that, but that's the way it's talked about as an affo a partial affordable housing solution. We, are, we already could do this. And that, the only difference I see between a room rental and an accessory living area is that if it's called an li accessory living area, it has to have a wet bar and it, it can't be a short-term rental. I, I, I would flip that a little bit. Okay, so if you're calling it an accessory living, living area, you said it would have to have a wet bar. I would say the other way around. If you have a room rental with a wet bar, then it is an accessory living area. Right? I don't get the difference, but go well, ahead. in one one case, the, it's um, the county telling telling a property owner that they have to put in a wet bar. The other is that if they can, the wet bar, if they put in a wet bar and they're renting out the room, uh, then it's an or if they put in a wet bar and they have a bedroom, then it's an accessory living area. Right? Otherwise, it's just a room. Otherwise, it's just a room, which they can also do, and they can rent up to three of them. But so this is just sort of aligning And those. there's no restriction on the short-term rental if it's a room rental and not. A, so if it doesn't have a wet bar, then you can, you can do a short-term rental without any restrictions. Currently, yes. Um, again, that I think the whole short-term rental issue is going to be uh, defined further down the road after we get more direction from the Board of Supervisors. Okay, well, I, you know, I'll, let's wait for public comment before uh, I start blathering on here. I just have a, a general comment, if I may, that maybe being newer to this than everyone else is that somehow the terminology's got to be 
clears, like a room rental or accessory. It's like, it's so, it, even hearing your, your brief presentation, it's confusing. You, you gotta look, and maybe you're trying to do this, and I, uh, somehow the, there needs to be a clear kind of uh, terminology used that <coughs> would be very helpful, because I find it really confusing. Is it a room or right. accessory well, that's living area? It's like, that is what we're trying to do here. So it's is term, to have term, clear term terminology, and this, if, if you've got... I don't mean in terms of whether it's a wet bar or not a wet bar, right. but more in kind of the, the terminology of the different types of living accommodations you're providing. That like an ABC somehow was really almost that simple to understand. Well, Rather than the, the terms seem to be, maybe they're trying to be very descriptive, but they're, they're confusing at the same time. Yes. I totally agree. Okay. They are they are very confusing, okay. and, so you're and working on that. And that's too, then. Yeah. that's what I'm trying. Yeah. That's part yeah. of what I'm trying to do here is to is to make it a little bit more clear. We're trying to refine this language so our definitions are, are more clear, and say, look, if you if you've got a room with a wet bar, it's an accessory living area. Okay. If you've that got a, a very, if that's you've a got very a, confusing. I don't know why I find that confusing, but it's it's like a room rental. I don't know. It's it's. It, and if you're renting it out, then it would be a room rental. If you've got a room with a wet bar, then it would be an accessory living area. If you've got a full kitchen, then it's a second unit if you've already got a main kitchen. It, it is still, I find it confusing. Even though you, you think those three terms are ones you're going to hang on to, I just, uh, it just the, are descriptive terms of the different, maybe there's no better way, but it just sounds, Well, it's hard to kind of get a clear picture. When you, I, I know, and that's, and that's what we're trying to deal with. Because you've hit on, I think, probably the most important issue is that all the terms are very, yes. they overlap and they're kind of confusing and that's why we're trying to refine this yeah. to make a distinction. This is not a junior accessory dwelling unit. It is not a unit. It's not what we're talking about here. It's what we already allow. You're already allowed to have, you're allowed to rent a room in your, in, in your house. You're allowed to have a wet bar. It's already allowed. We're just trying to refine that somewhat. Right. And then down the road, and we've already got a second unit permit. Those are two different things, right? And down the road, if the state takes action, then we'll have to probably revise those to deal with um, whatever their new their new regulations say. Sorry, yes. Do you have any data on the number of of these kinds of units that exist in the county? No. Commissioner Dickinson. Uh, in response to Commissioner Paoli, I've been here the longest of anyone, and I actually found this very confusing. I mean, when I uh, started reading it, I thought this was the county's approach to junior second units, and I followed that in various cities, including San Rafael, where they, uh, six months ago or so, adopted an ordinance, and I thought that's what we were doing, but then it was combined with what I call the borders quarters, where you just <laughs> rent out a room in a house, and the way I read it, it actually goes beyond what is allowed now in that now we allow a sink, but this allows really everything. I mean, it allows a microwave, a toaster oven, it allows a mini fridge. So what were borders quarters where you rented a room in a house and shared the common facilities, now someone could um, have a complete mini kitchen in their accessory um, living area. Yeah, they're they're already allowed to do that. That is not a change. But they right now they can only have a wet bar, right? And that's true with accessory living areas as well. They can only have a wet no, bar. No, but they can have a microwave. They can have a toaster or a toaster oven. But if you look at the fridge. existing definition of what a wet bar is, it includes all those things. It includes the six uh, six feet of of um, counter right, space. Six feet is and in the, there now. Right. We've been in implementing and enforcing this for, for years already. But it includes <laughs> full-on appliances, right? Right. You wouldn't be able to have like a full Ovens. stove uh, with an oven and a full but you uh, could have refrigerator. A toaster oven, right? Right. right. You could have a toaster oven. You right. could have hot a microwave. Plate, yeah. You could, could have a hot plate. Right. Yeah. yeah. And people are, are often doing this already. I know. I mean, they yeah. have for years. They put the microwave in the closet when you go out to do the inspection. And no. It made it easy. but um, They yeah. don't, though. When we go out and do the inspection, um, our code enforcement people will take a look, and they will measure the counter space, and they will look at whether or not you've got a microwave. And as long as it meets the definition of wet bar, it's fine. So we have a considerable amount of, I don't have statistics, but I have a considerable, we have a considerable amount of experience already in, in determining 
okay, well, is this a full kitchen or is this really just a wet bar? We do it fairly frequently. Yeah, I know it's been an issue for years trying to track down the moving microwaves, but let me just say also that um, this has no size limitations, whereas typically a, um, a junior second unit, the, uh, the, the ordinances have been adopted, all do have size limitations, but this could be 1,200 square feet or something, although it's confusing because it talks about a room. But can you have a sitting room? It doesn't actually even say you can have a bathroom with the unit, but. Well, it doesn't say you have to have a bathroom. You can have, a ba you can have multiple bathrooms in your house. This well, is it talks about a bedroom. Right. You but can it rent doesn't talk about the junior second unit ordinances that I review do talk about either with an independent bathroom or with a shared bathroom. Yeah, and that's, why I, was, clear. And that's why I was trying to make the distinction clear that this is not a junior accessory dwelling unit. We will, when the state, now there are other jurisdictions that have um, attempted to have these very small junior accessory dwelling units. Those are essentially second units. They are actually units. And there are other jurisdictions which are, have attempted to do this. And um, I kind of point out some of the restrictions which are placed in those codes because they're trying to give, um, you know, the cover to um, those homeowners who want to be able to do this. They're, they're fairly inflexible, though. So we, in our current regulatory framework, don't have a, a, a size limit. It's somewhat difficult to come up with a size um, limit for one of these. They're not actual units. They're just part of the rest of the house um, or in, the, in, the, in a pool house or whatever. So it, it's fairly open-ended, and it's because it's really part of the single-family residential use. <coughs> it's not a separate unit. And then it doesn't count, um, it isn't counted by HCD as a unit, whereas a junior second unit, according to Novato, they say that HCD will count those as separate units. That's right. And so what arena. Novato and Santa Fe are trying to do is to be able to use these junior accessory dwelling units towards um, the 50% of units they can count. Um, but the county uh, isn't trying to do that. We don't, for one thing, we've we max out our, our allotment of that just to a regular second units anyway, so it wouldn't help us if we did try and do it. Um, but also our current approach is much more flexible, and so we're not attempting to do that in this um, proposal. Maybe it would be useful to go on to public testimony. Oh, continue. Can I just ask a, yeah. a clarifying question? So the definition of room rental says individual bedrooms and the definition of accessory living area says a room. So is that deliberate? So it, so the room could be a family room. It could be any kind of room. It doesn't have to be a bedroom to be an accessory living area. Is that, is that intentional? It, it's intentional, and it's, in, it, it's intentionally um, somewhat open-ended because, after all, I mean, if, if you think about a studio apartment, you have a bedroom and a kitchen, the only separate room is usually the bathroom. So we're not trying to regulate this and say, well, you've got to create a separate, a separate room if you're renting out the, the lower portion of your house, for example. The main you know, floor is where the family lives or upstairs. But then there is this area downstairs uh, where you, know, you can have people who are somewhat independent from the role of the rest of the house, although really they're using facilities in the rest of the house. It's just that they've got a little bit more independence down there. Okay, uh, that will end our questioning of Jeremy for a moment. And we'll go on to public testimony. Um, Ken, I think this is the subject that you wanted to speak to. So, okay, why don't you come first, Ken Driscoll. I hope I don't freeze up here. You, you have, you have three minutes, Mr. Driscoll. Uh, I'll keep going. Okay, my name is Ken, and um, I've lived in the county in uh, Lucas Valley for 23 years, raised uh, two boys, um, coached Little League for seven years, and feel like I'm part of the community and, and love it here. And I retired two years ago, and when I did, I didn't know if I'd be able to stay in my house, but uh, we did a short-term rental out of our, turn the boys' bedrooms into, um, you know, a sitting room and a bedroom. And we've used Airbnb, it's been a great platform. 
and it's the only way I can stay in my house. And um, there's the county plan does uh, done every four years has um, they came out and they said 25% of the senior uh, people in Moran are over 60 years old, and 25% of those are struggling to make ends meet. And I guess I'm one of those. And I can I'm doing okay, but if you ban short-term rentals, I'm screwed. And I'll have to sell my house and leave, and I don't know where I'd go. And I don't think that's fair. And um, we have two boys that had two parking places out in the front. Now we have one when a guest arrives. And uh, we've had 70 reviews of our place, and out of five stars, we've had 69 fives and one four. I think is about the biggest you saw. But it's the kind of thing where, um, with what he's proposing, I'm hoping that you won't go and just rubber stamp it because I think by, and even he was reluctant to ban STRs. I think if you say, well, the County Planning Commission, you go to the fall and they say, well, the County Planning Commission, it's a strike against STRs already. It's like the County Planning Commission already said, well, they've already done a lot of research and they don't like it and they want to ban it. I, I think there's too much discussion, too many, my life is in the balance, so to speak. I think there's too much involved to uh, just say no. And uh, the other thing is, I think you can compromise even in his scenario by saying, homeowner, uh, like myself, maybe limit the number of days per year. As far as, uh, so that you're not sort of saying, well, we're taking housing stock. I personally wouldn't rent it for 30 days or more because I need to have the space for my kids come to town on the holidays. And I don't want to get the situation where you rent to somebody, you find out you don't like them, and you can't get them out for 90 days. And it's not, it's like, that's a headache I don't want to go to. I only need so much money to be able to survive, and it's a lot of work doing this stuff. You know, I got to clean up and everything after everybody. And I love it because I've met so many wonderful people. But at the same time, you know, um, I'm asking you to include me in the county plan so that I can stay. And uh, there's even the mayor of Sausalito, Jill Hoffman, she said, we're all for seniors aging in place. Well, you gotta back that statement up, you know? So anyway, that's my two cents. Thanks. M Mr. Driscoll, can I ask you a question? Yes. Did you say that these are rooms or the rooms that have what he's, we're calling now a wet bar with a sink? And well, a I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid to say too much because I might just, but here's the deal. I've got a bedroom, a sitting room, and uh, there's no cooking facility, and, uh, and that's it. And I'm licensed, I, I pay my TOT happily, and um, you know I wanna be part of the system. I don't wanna have to be driven underground, I probably wouldn't be able to anyway, but just because all these, it, it just seems like there's layers, all these definitions, it's so picky uni. And you're going, okay, well, this is a junior second unit, but this is, well, this is just a room and a house, but gee, if you add this, you know. Okay, I understand, it's kind of, yeah. Well, it's not just confusing. I, I didn't ask, if you, yeah. if I was just wondering if it's a simple room that's not included in this discussion today. Right. Uh, and there is no restriction today being uh, imposed upon a, sim a simple room. But, but to make a statement to ban STRs yeah. through this, I still would like to see at least a limited number of days, allow seniors right, to do it. a limited number of days at least all right. on under the like the wet bar areas and all Good. that stuff too. Because if you don't, then it's just gonna carry over into saying Thank and you, Mr. Ban the yeah. thing, so. anyway, Thank you. Uh, Rachel Guinness. And, and Rachel, you're representing lilypadhomes.org and so you have five minutes to speak. Oh, that's wonderful, thank you. I was wondering how I was gonna do it in three minutes. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so my name is Rachel Guinness. I'm the executive founding director of Lilypad Homes and the architect of the Junior Accessory Dwelling Unit Code that we have been passing around the county and have now taken to the state level. Uh, we've gotten uh, a great deal of cooperation because it, it's such a sensible thing to do. I have to say, um, my nonprofit, uh, specifically facilitates the development of accessory dwelling units. I am an expert on this subject. I certainly intersect with the subject of vacation rentals all the time. And I can tell you that your planning department has not reached out to me to talk to me about how you guys should be implementing this uh, responsibly and, um, and to everybody's advantage. 
And so I want to take this opportunity to point out that the report, and I'm so sorry to say, not only represent, misrepresents the code you have currently, but it also misrepresents state code when it comes to accessory dwelling units or second units. So what you're proposing to do here um, doesn't really have anything to do with junior accessory dwelling units. It's actually talking about creating accessory dwelling units without calling them units <laughs> and not accounting for the, um, for the increase in the designed occupancy of a home. So it's basically undermining state law to create accessory dwelling units because when you do that and expand the designed occupancy of a home or the density of a home, you have to take into consideration the energy, water, sewer, parking. You have to vet it through local agencies. Um, so I can tell you that I exist to build <laughs> um, housing, more affordable housing, and redevelop the way we're living in our homes to, uh, to create one of these units. So um, as far as um, state law for second units is concerned, um, Second units are not, they don't say that they do not increase the, the density of a lot uh, by any means. They say that, um, that second units shall not be considered to exceed the allowable density of a lot. So your code, your room rental code, specifically says that you can, um, that you can rent out three bedrooms of a home. Not any room of a home, but bedrooms. And it says you, it can be a bedroom even in an accessory structure. So let's say you have created a bedroom that sits on top of your detached garage. So that counts as a bedroom. And so all the parking and water and everything associated with that bedroom has already been accounted for in the permit that created it. Now you're saying that uh, they're saying that it's actually existing code that you can do this in three rooms. Well, frankly, that's not existing code. Your code very specifically says bedrooms, and that makes a difference because all of the water and energy, road use, parking, everything associated with the bedrooms in your home has already been accounted for in the original permit. So all junior accessory dwelling units do. Uh, you guys are allowing what amounts to one in up to three bedrooms right now. There's no reason an incorporated county shouldn't be like, you know, clicking its heels to be able to pass this code. It makes sure one of them is counted as a legal living unit. And that word, unit, matters. It matters to make sure that we plan properly. It matters to make sure that you can get the financing to create the housing unit. It matters so when somebody wants to purchase that home, they can qualify for the loan based on the income from that unit. You can't expand the designed occupancy of a home and just think you cannot use the word unit and think the state or, or any of the agencies that we have to work with to make sure we have a sustainable, responsible community um, might not notice. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a little taken back and it's a little frustrating because I am an expert on this subject and I would be more than happy to talk to this commission and the planning department about a very responsible road forward to um, lessening requirements for second units, state second units, and, um, and instituting a junior accessory dwelling unit code so the room rentals that you allow right now will count as units. Um, again, you can't, in this case, you want to call a rose a rose because it opens doors. Um, so most of the people who want to create one of these want to because they need to because they need to, that they don't necessarily have the funding to be able to. So I would like to know, um, would the Marin Housing Authority that allows you to take out a loan to create a junior accessory dwelling unit through the rehabilitation loan, will they allow that loan to be used for an accessory dwelling area? Oh, and I can also tell you too that um, a, a second unit is defined by having sleeping, living, food preparation, cooking, um, and. Um, and parking facilities. It has nothing to do with a full kitchen versus a wet bar. In fact, junior accessory dwelling units count as a, a unit and they only have a wet bar. So that's clearly incorrect. You <laughs> so passed your five minutes. So. I'm so sorry. So a lot of this needs to, a really close look. Um, it's uh, largely erroneous. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rachel.
Is there anyone else who would like to address the commission on this issue? Seeing none, then I'll close public testimony and bring it back to the commission. Any further questions of staff or comments now to make? Commissioner Casillas. Um, I have a question and then a comment. The question is, why did you put the short-term rental limit on this new, newly, new word, new definition? Why, why did you do that? Because it just seemed that, especially when you're going into this whole process, we are, not just you, but all of us are going to be marching into this difficult situation of, of grappling with what to do with short-term rentals. So why did you just sort of gratuitously put it here? Um, I think that there's concern uh, at the political level um, about the um, expansion of uh, short-term rentals. And uh, since we were doing this, it seemed like maybe moving ahead with some restriction in that um, way would be a good idea. Um, however, I, like I said, I put it in somewhat reluctantly. Uh, and it's exactly for some of the reasons we've heard today. Um, there's a larger strategic question, I think, with short-term rentals and really understanding what the effects of these regulations would be um, uh, is important, I think. This would be a, a small step uh, towards restricting them. But um, I think if your commission felt like this was not the appropriate time, uh, because not enough study had been done, um, then it would be an easy change to take that, that portion of the code amendment out and um, essentially reserve that discussion to a later date when we have a broader understanding and a broader discussion of short-term rentals and, and just deal with it then. I think the way it's written now, it's a, it's a, it's a disincentive First of all, you have to put a wet bar in it. And then once you go to the expense of as, assuming there is not a wet bar there already and that these things are not just real cheap, you've got to put in plumbing and maybe some wiring and da-da-da. What, what do you mean you have to put a wet bar in it? Okay, so so if it's not, if you don't put the wet bar in, then it's not an accessory living area. That's right. It's room rental. It, you, you can rent out three bedrooms in your in your house, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I just don't really get why we're doing this, folks. I don't, I just, it just doesn't make any sense to me because we can already do it. Now, I mean, I, I'm understanding some of what Rachel is saying, and you were very, very clear that this is not a junior accessory dwelling unit. It's not a unit. Uh, but I, I just don't really get it. Richard Dickinson? Uh, um, kind of follow up on that. I don't understand how uh, we would have a limit on short-term rentals for the accessory living area, but then have none if you call it a room rental. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. If I, someone complained, I just say, well, it's a room rental. And then there's no limitation. Well, if it has, it a, web, if it has a web bar, then it's, then it's an accessory living area, in which case the restriction would stand. So in other words, um, what the gentleman was describing in terms of having a bedroom and a sitting room uh, and a bathroom, I think he said, but there was no wet bar, then there's no restriction on short-term rentals. If he decided to put a wet bar in, in that case, then there would be this restriction on short-term rentals. Why? Why, why, does, why does the restriction go with the sink and a, and a toaster oven? Maybe it shouldn't. Uh, how are short-term rentals control to the the objections and the critic uh, your neighbors complaining about too many cars they're not controlled. How, how do you control that we don't we don't control them no but you're saying if, if someone can't have a short-term rental oh you mean if if this is so, I'm if saying, someone's viol if someone's violating currently there is no restriction on short-term rentals you I think what you're asking is if we if we accepted these amendments how would we enforce it is that is that yes correct? It would be very difficult. Enforcement of short-term rentals, rentals is extremely difficult, and that's one of the key issues that needs to be studied. Right, right. Yeah. Have you learned anything from other jurisdictions and the work so far in that regard? What not to do. 
Yeah. <laughs> or how to deal with that particular issue. It's not an easy one. You can't, you can't provide any more testimony yet. Thank you. Uh, so, any other comments? Commissioner Beeley. Yeah, I, I, sh I think I share the, the confusion a bit with, with Commissioner Cresilius, and, and I appreciate your openness to saying, you know, maybe it's not the right time. Um, I think per particularly where uh, a time restriction is involved, I think that we're jumping the gun because there's it's kind of a hornet's nest of, of issues. It's it's a huge um, issue that, that so many jurisdictions are dealing with right now, and to just kind of throw it in with this one limited definition is really kind of putting the cart before the horse. So if you take out the restriction, the 30-day restriction, and just you know define accessible living area, I still, I still am not really sure what the purpose is of defining that separately from a room rental, except to say that one might be a bedroom and one might not be a bedroom. Um, but putting a sink, you know, a 12 by 12 inch sink, because the sink can't be very big. So putting, you know, putting a small sink in a toaster oven in a room somehow changes the legal definition of what that room is just seems a bit specious to me, kind of going in the other direction of where we want to go in terms of streamlining and making the development code more easy to understand. Commissioner Holland. Um, Jeremy, would a room in a your proverbial pool house room could that be rented as a room rental if it didn't say have a, a wet yeah. bar in it so the vacant chicken coop could be you're a room talking rental. about in a, in a pool house where there's no where there's no um wet bar wet bar yeah yeah it's just it's just another so room. a room rental does not have to be a bedroom it could right. be any thing that's more or less enclosed. Right. I mean, there's a limit on, on the number of bedrooms that you can rent. So if mm -hmm. if you had an accessory structure with four bedrooms and you were renting out all four, that would not be allowed. Okay. So yeah. what if you had three bedrooms in your house and a pool house? Can you rent out four? No. So the, pool house, the pool house is the bedroom? You still have to keep it to three. If there's a if if it's a bedroom, yeah, you still have to keep it to three. Okay. But the pool because house isn't a bedroom. Capacity and <laughs> those things. I have a couple of some specific questions I wanted to ask. Um, so you could have an ALA access according to this right. in a second unit. If you had a two bedroom second unit, one of them could be an ALA if you put a wet bar in. Correct. If you had a two bedroom second unit. One of one of them could, I suppose, although um, they're they're relatively small. Generally, second units are, are generally rather That's relatively small. But you're, yeah, yeah. You, you could. theoretically it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, then I want I had some questions on the tables. Um, pages the two facing pages, two dash thirty nine and two dash forty six. I'm curious that you would allow ALAs in C1 retail business and CP planned commercial, but not in resort and commercial recreation. Resort and commercial recreation often has living, it may have dormitory kind of living things mm -hmm. in it. So what's, what's, why is there a differentiation? Um, I, you know, I think in the broader set of of um, code amendments, probably have to look at some of these these tables. But where I was, what I was doing here was going through here and saying, well, when, whenever you'd have a room rental which is allowed, then um, so you just mirror. Then you would be allowed to also have um, a accessory living area. So I'm kind of tr I'm trying to mirror mirror okay. that. So in this case, I'm just it's just con yeah. it's consistency. Now on the next page, two fifty seven. I tried to look this up on the. Um, the online codes this morning, Jeremy, and the tables are all garbled in mm. the uh, Muni codes. Thing. Really? None of them were displayed. Oh. Um, but anyway, uh, so I couldn't verify. I'm surprised under OA that affordable housing is listed as a dash. I thought we had opened up the OA zoning district throughout to affordable housing. Or did the board take it out? 
Um, it, I think perhaps the board took it out. I do remember there was a discussion, but I don't remember why exactly that that was done to Actually, take affordable housing out. out of OA. I think the commission took it out. No, we, oh. It was in, but I thought we took it out. But. I think we left it in. I was the opposite. I know it's in for the coastal zone because of the Coast Guard. Right. Um, but I was, uh, so I just wondered whether I had missed something along the line have been taken out here. No, I mean, when you start going through the, through the tables, you start picking up there some discrepancies, and <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll admit I did a draft where I tried to start doing those, but then I thought better of it, <laughs> and um, just left it to what we're trying to deal with today because this is sort of a precursor to the broader. But I, I hear what you're saying, and, and perhaps taking a look at these tables and trying to make sure that they're really internally consistent in terms of mm -hmm. what you're allowed to do where would be a good well, idea. I remember the discussion we had about affordable housing in OA <laughs> and we came down to the conclusion that <clears throat> it's basically up to the agency that controls that open area and we would defer to them um, but we would permit it and let them make the decision. Uh, anyway, okay. um, yeah. On 3-78 um, this is in your definitions, your definition of an ALA number H. Mm -hmm. We talk about not be available for lease for a period of less than 30 days. Is there a distinction between lease and rent? No, they're the same thing. I think you might want to make sure that you don't get some nitpicker. <laughs> um, like you. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> to me, it jumped out right away. <laughs> and then I was curious on the wet bar definition on page 8-61. <coughs> The first line says, it's an area that accommodates a bar sink and small food preparation appliances. Then the last sentence says, wet bars are not considered food preparation facilities. Those two statements seem it's confusing, conflicting. Yeah. So it has a pl it can have appliances, but it can't be the f it can't be like a full kitchen. That's what well, it's trying to get. Well, you're using all those appliances for food preparation. Could you have built-in burners in your six-foot um, counter? Uh, you can have a hot plate, right? A plug-in hot. Right. I believe. I. I believe so, but I, I have to check on that. I think you know if you, if this goes forward, which probably it isn't, you might want to. If this isn't sending a mixed message on food preparation appliances are okay, but food preparation facilities are not. Well, we could just change it to say small appliances. Okay. Would that, yeah. Oh, small. Accommodates a bar sink and small appliances, such as a toaster. I see what I see how you're being. Um. I just did a I just did a kitchen remodel, and I spent seven months using these food preparation appliances, and I fed a family of four three meals a day. <laughs> so I would definitely call those food preparation facilities. Okay. Well, on the bathrooms, if you're going to leave, uh, put a whole a definition of accessory living areas into the code, which legalizes them in a sense, makes them a recognized element, I think there has to be a requirement that there is an accessible bathroom facility. I know of a case of a guy had an older Inverness house, had three little accessory structures, who knows what they started out as, tool shed, um, chicken coop, and so on. And by the time, you know, 40, 50 years later, they've all got a sink in them, but none of them had bathrooms. But he had them rented. And he had this nasty little bathroom in a enclosed back porch on his house that he unlocked for two hours a day, <laughs> an hour in the morning, an hour in the after evening. <laughs> and the tenants had to schedule themselves for those hours. Otherwise, hello, bushes. <laughs> and so I think, you know, it, once we put into the code that this is a place we recognize as being a place where people are legally entitled to live, there also has to be a requirement that there is a 24-hour accessible bathroom facility mm. somewhere on the premises. So then there's, I mean, there's two different ways of looking at it. Right now, you can you can rent out a bedroom in, in your, three bedrooms in your house. Presumably there's bathrooms in the house. Right, right. Let me just take it take it forward. You can rent that out, and there's not a requirement that you have a separate bathroom for each of those room rentals. That would be very restrictive if we said that. 
right? Very restrictive because generally, people, thing, right? But then, so if you carry that forward, what we're doing here is essentially simply refining and trying to clarify what we've already got. And um, so I think what you're saying is, if you want to put in a wet bar, right? You can't have anything, no wet, no wet bar sink, no nothing. But if you want to put one of those in, then you have to create a separate bathroom. No, there has to be a bathroom you can go to. That's the accessible to. There has to be an accessible bathroom. You can't rent it out as just a room without those kind of facilities available to you. But there's always a bathroom in the house. Not if the door's locked. So you want to have you want to change it so that there's a, a, a restrict there's a code section in here saying if you want to put in a wet bar then you must keep the door unlocked to access the bathroom? I, I would say that if you're going to rent rooms or accessory living areas, you have to make bathrooms available to the tenants. I think already in the building code, there are requirements which get at what you're talking about, which essentially, because this is part of the house, right? right? And the, So the assumption is that if you're because what people could do already is rent out a room in their house, up to three rooms in their house, and then lock out the tenants in the bathroom. That's already the case. We've never actually, you know, had that many, you know, problems, you know, with it. I mean, there are always exceptions, but that's never really been a problem um, to to a great degree. Um, so I'm just a little bit concerned and in, in really sort of complicating and ratcheting down these things because right now we have a fairly simple flexible allowance for people to have wet bars and to have um, room room rentals there's currently so if you said that to um, have an accessory living area there would be a requirement for a bathroom I, I, I understand um, intuitively what you're trying to get at the problem is when you actually start to try to regulate that you run into all kinds of um, unintended consequences. So, for example, then there would be, um, you could have an un un unlimited number of wet bars in your home, which is the case now, anyway, um, unless, and say, well, it's not an accessory living area because there's no bathroom. So it could actually create a disincentive for creating a bathroom in some ways. So it's just, it's be yeah, because of the way that. That's a good thing. People should not be encouraged to develop living areas where there is no bathroom facility available. Well, but they might be encouraged to put in. They wouldn't be. They wouldn't be limited to three because if there's no bathroom, then it's not counted as an accessory living area. It doesn't say that. If, if I may. Yes. I mean, I, I think I, I understand where Wade is coming from, but I think that you know, this is where we get to where you know bad facts make bad law. Right, the circumstance that he's talking about, my guess is that under existing development code, it would not pass muster anyway. So I think writing, writing. I think that we're still struggling with whether the accessory living area is something that we want to approve, and then to further complicate it by, you know, creating a bathroom restriction based on a circumstance that that weight experience, which is, you know, of course disgusting, but sounds like it, you know, is maybe. It's a code enforcement case. It's a code enforcement case. It's right. not something that is going to pop up that we need to regulate through, you know, in, in this process. I think if we, if we could stick to whether or not an accessory legal, uh, an accessory living area is even something that we want to consider first um, and then get to, you know, bathroom regulations when we talk about the larger. My concern is. So environmental health, if somebody comes out because there's been a complaint that this, this former chicken coop now has a sink in it and qualifies as an ALA, doesn't have access to a bathroom, and the owner says, there's no requirement. Look, look what it says, ALA. It doesn't say anything about bathrooms. I'm okay. Yeah, but that's not what... <laughs> Jeremy, aren't you covered by the fact that yeah. uh, ALA is uh, presumes and does require existing in a essentially a single family detached home right uh, or calling it an ALA doesn't exempt you from the building code or the septic right. codes right you got minimum property standards yeah exactly 
That's why these are code enforcement cases, because they're not conforming to the standards. Right, it's just a room in a single family residence which has its own set of building codes and requirements for, yeah. right. Chair Theron? Yes, Mr. Chair. So I have an idea, and which, will, which, which means it will have to come back to the commission. But to me, the definition of an accessory living area and a room rental is a distinction without a difference except right. for the wet right. bar. And the, and the wet bar just doesn't seem that important to me. So it would seem to me that we should just uh, amend, take out this, all the excess, accessory living area and just amend the definition of a room rental and say that, and we have to decide whether it has to be a bedroom or not because that's a question that's left open with the accessory living area. It doesn't have to be a bedroom. But it's a rental of individual rooms in a house. It may or may not have a wet bar. And, I mean, I don't know how the rest of you feel about that, but to me this is adding a lot of confusion and it just doesn't right. pass the straight face test. That's, that's my feeling. Well, I just have to add, add I'm, I feel exactly the same. I can't get it, the difference between a rental room and a room, a be bedroom you're renting and a bedroom with a wet bar or not a wet bar. I can't it, it get how why that's important to create a whole different uh, name well, for this rental unit. Okay. A, a bedroom is available for short-term rental. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Currently. Right. What you're trying to do is create an accessible living area that, at least as written, has a 30-day minimum. That would be part of the impact of this ordinance change. That's right. right. So when you're talking about ALAs, a distinction that is being written into this creates the opportunity for a rental rather than a short-term stay. I, I mean, well, I'm sorry, it creates the opportunity for, I'm, I'm sure I got it, that. It, if you have the 30-day limitation, then you're not getting the short-term rental people. You're not getting Airbnb, right? Yeah. I, all I'm saying is it, it, it creates more meaningful contribution to the conversation about affordable housing as an ALA than it, it seems to me than, than just having room rental be the only definition we have. Oh, that's a good point. So if it's just room rentals, then it's nothing different than what we have as short-term rentals and it's all there. But short-term rentals take those potential affordable living situations out of the equation. So I, I don't know, I, to me, if you've got a 30-day limit and you're calling it whatever you want to call it, call it an ALA, call it anything else, it does create a housing option and, and sanctifies and, and sets regulations that allows for that housing option. And it doesn't exist now. And I think that's something that has some potential value. I think that's the charge in a way from the workshops the supervisors had to us and to you to say, Let's try to figure out a way to create that additional housing option. I, I ag agree to a certain extent, except that I don't think that the amendments that I'm proposing here really change our existing regulatory framework all that much. Agreed. Right. I mean, people could do exactly the same thing if you didn't do this code amendment. It's The intention is to try to package it in such a way that you know, a person can come in, they can look at the table and say, okay, accessory living area, here's what I want to do. It's going to have, like, you know, a small kind of wet bar. It's going to be, you know, a room downstairs. It's going to have a bed in there. It's going to have this little area. Um, it's easier for people to kind of wade through if you sort of name it, define it, and then have it in the tables. It doesn't mean they can't do it right now. In fact, they can so I don't think that the substantive change to the code quite extends as far as what you're saying. Okay. Except for the minimum rental time. Yeah. Right. Right. There are, there are, I'm not saying that there are no substantive changes here. That's one of them. And if, if your commission feels like it's really better to deal with that short-term rental issue when we're looking at it as a more global issue, then by all means, strike it. Sure. 
Mr. Dickinson? I'm not at all convinced that it makes any sense to move ahead with this. Um, I think it's very confusing. I think within the county and generally people have heard the, the term uh, junior second units. Um, and it, that is something that I've supported. I do support. I read through the Novato and the San Rafael ordinances, and they are slightly different, but they're based on the same, same format. And I think it's important for the county, instead of doing this, which I think is confusing, to instead move ahead with the junior second unit ordinance. And using what has already been done, because there is kind of a framework, the, uh, San Rafael is a little bit different, and it requires it use existing space, whereas Novato allows you to add on up to 500 square feet. But um, I think it's important for us to move on with that. And I see this step as just delaying the county getting to what we should be doing, which is um, creating an ordinance that allows junior second unit. I live in San Rafael, in the city of San Rafael. There's the house next to me has had what is a junior second unit for years. They have been able to legalize it under Santa Fe's ordinance. They could actually legalize it now because they comply with all the requirements. And I think it's important to move ahead with that rather than doing this, confusing people. They'll think this is our junior second unit ordinance. I think it will tend to put off the, uh, uh, extend the timeline for the city, for the county to actually address what we should be doing. So I'm not at all convinced that this makes sense. Katie, do you want to comment on that? Oh, I agree with Commissioner Dickinson. And I, I also just want to make sure that we all understand that there are no income limits or rental, rent control at all on these. And I know for a fact that some of these rooms and houses, a bedroom with a shared bathroom, they're going for $1,000 a month or more. My neighborhood is $1,100. Yeah, so all you have <coughs> to do is go on Craigslist and go under shared housing and that's what you're going to find you know so are they more affordable than a one-bedroom apartment you know a market rate on a one-bedroom apartment yes they are an alternative but that doesn't mean they're fairly priced mm -hmm. you know so but they are they are generally less than a one-bedroom apartment would be down the street so they are more affordable than that but they're but they're, you know, homeowners right. are getting a lot of money for these things. Um, to me, it's it's quite it's quite shocking. Um, but it is another ho another housing option, and if at least you know it, you got a a, a, a more a, a junior second unit that really was a unit. I think you're getting a little bit more, you know, you're getting a more uh, serviceable unit. So I think that at least half, maybe more, of the Planning Commission is is moving in the direction that Commissioner Dickinson and Commissioner Casillas just spoke about. Um, so uh, I w I, do we want to, at this point, uh, make a decision as to whether we're going to move forward with this or not, um, and recommend we're not to recommend anything? I think that we should be clear about what direction we're recommending instead of just saying, no, we don't like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for one thing, we want to defer the question of short-term rentals to the larger discussion, which is this fall, are we talking? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a really I'm sorry, I, I should actually clarify that. We're going to do a kind of white paper workshop with the Board of Supervisors this fall, uh, and then coming out of that, there will be in, in all likelihood code amendments, but they they would not be proposed this fall. They would follow up from the, the Board of Supervisors discussion. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, when we were doing the coastal, the local coastal program, we heard a lot about short-term rentals. And what was that, three years ago? Mm -hmm. That we were, you know, cool. talking about that. So um, I think it's an idea whose time has come. I think, I think we need to, the county needs to make a decision on it. Would the commission be comfortable if I ask Mr. Cristillius to make a motion Get second, maybe we can discuss it. We can decide. Okay. Okay. So, so I move that uh, we do not approve uh, approve this proposal of changes of the development code, and that we recommend to the super or go through the minutes or however it gets commu communicate to the board of supervisors that we feel that a decision about short-term rentals should be included in the overall analysis. 
and that w that we should move ahead with a junior second unit ordinance and make no changes to the de development code at this point. I'll second that. So moved by Commissioner Cecilia, seconded by Commissioner Dickinson. Now any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous? Okay, thank you. Now we we'll go on to item number. I'm going to take a 